I would like to occasionally talk about Sigmund Freud on this channel. And I'm going to begin with a book that I think would be a, a good place to begin studying Freud. This book is, is called Group Psychology and the Analysis of the Ego. It was published originally in 1921, which is a year after the publication of that famous essay, Beyond the Pleasure Principle. And that the timeline is important, that it was um, after the publication of Beyond the Pleasure, Prin Beyond Pleasure Principle, because that uh, Beyond Pleasure Principle essay is, uh, is considered to be a turning point in Freud's uh, thought about not only the, the place of pleasure, the libidinal satisfaction, but also his conception of ego, the place of ego in uh, the mental functioning, uh, was modified to some degree. So what is he doing in this book, in the book Group Psychology? What is his task? Is, it, uh, is, he, is he trying to develop a social psychology? Because it's, it is, the title is Group Psychology. Is Freud now uh, saying, okay, I'm done with groups, I'm, I'm done with individual psychoanalysis, now I want to do a different project, I want to do social psychology. In the very beginning of the book, he, he rejects that. Uh, he says, uh, there is one psychology, basically. The, for Freud, the project of psychoanalysis is all-encompassing. So it is, he is not doing a separate, he's not developing a separate field of social psychology. Partly because he says that psychology, individual psychology, almost always is social. It is always a social psychology. So it doesn't make much sense to talk about group versus social psychology in most cases. So what is he doing in this book? What he's doing is trying to answer this question. And the question is, why the behavior of people in individuals, why individual behavior is different when we are separate and when we are part of a group, when we are, especially when we are really uh, merging in, in, within a group. So he wants to explain certain phenomena that we can think about as group psychology. These phenomena are in, they include uh, the suggestibility. So we become, we become more suggestible. So an idea that we might not believe when we are alone, uh, when we are in a quiet place in our, our home, away from the group, we might be more skeptical. We might not believe in, in those ideas. But the same idea, if we, if we are part of a group and we have the energy of the group with us, we might find it much easier to believe. So that's suggestibility. And this suggestibility allows ideas and emotions and attitudes to pass very easily across a, a group of individuals. So this is the phenomenon of contagion. Contagion is a spread, the rapid sp and easy spread of an idea or an emotion, an attitude, a belief, uh, spreading of, of that within a group of people. Another part of that, the phenomenon of group psychology, is a moral conscience that is different in separate individuals and when individuals are in a group together. It is not necessarily the case that people become, we, we become immoral when we are in a group, that we do horrible things only when we are in a group. Um, instead, Freud points out, uh, correctly, I think, that there is just more extreme cases and more variability in both directions, in both good and bad, when we, are, when we feel part of a group. So we do extreme acts of selflessness because of the group, because of being in a group, and we do extreme acts of horrible acts of evil when we uh, merge within a group, when we lose our individuality in a group. Something that is very impressive in this uh, group psychology book is that we see the image of Freud as somebody who carefully studies the works of other people. He carefully studies. The image that we have of Freud uh, in our current times is, a, is the image of a dogmatist, somebody who is dogmatically attached to a set of a few, a few ideas like infantile sexuality, or for example, his theories of sexuality or Oedipus complex. He's not a dogmatist if we go to his own work. He is not an ideologue. He's not attached uh, irrationally to his axioms. So he, and we see that in a way he treats the works of other people. I think the first person who is mentioned by name in this uh, book is Gustave Le Bon, who wrote a famous book on group psychology. We also read about William MacDougall, McDougall's book was published a year before uh, this book that we are talking about, also about um, group psychology, the mind of uh, people in group. And uh, we also read about an Italian uh, 
thinker, sociologist, I think, Scipio Siegel. So he's very respectful, even when he disagrees with these, um, these other writers. He's respectful, and he's, a, he, he shows that he has carefully studied them, even though he's going beyond them. So he, he relies on concepts by Le Bon, for example. Le Bon talks about the individuals who become leaders in a group. What is, what is the characteristics that they have? What is the feature? Le Bon's uh, ta uh, talking about this feature of prestige, uh, this difficult to explain quality that some individuals have. I think it's the uh, same as what Max Weber uh, talked about as uh, charisma in his uh, sociology of religion. So uh, let's get back to Freud's own uh, discussion of group psychology. Why is it that we become different when we become part of a group, when we, uh, when we join a group emotionally and emotionally and psychologically. His account, in short, is that there are primal modes of being. There, there are basic, basic modes of being that we all have access to, uh, that we have acquired, we have learned early in life when we, when we grew up in a family. There, there are ways that in which we deal with our, for example, father and mother, our primary caregivers. caregivers. And because we have acquired them uh, so early, they have a deep place in our, mind, in our psychology. Either we have learned these primal, primordial abilities early, or we have inherited them by virtue of being human. So it is in our nature. It is, so to speak, genetically, we are genetically programmed to have certain predispositions. And because they are so basic, so simple, and they're, they're so deep-seated in our psychology, that we can, on certain occasions, we regress, we fall back onto them. We fall back into the, the simpler uh, form of being, simpler, and more basic form of participating in a group. And that is one way to think about it, is a, a, our participation in a, in a primal horde. So a primal gang, basically. And a, a primal horde is different from other forms of social organization. And the ma major difference is what ties people within a primal horde, and that is libidinal affiliation. So it is, it is the, the instinct we have to connect uh, at a very basic familial level. And this is so basic that other form, other very strong forms of social organization and social bond, including military organization and priesthoods and religious organizations, those more artificial, more advanced for, forms of um, collective organizations, they even they use familial ties as models and as their metaphors, as their basic uh, sub substance, substructure, uh, substrata, because um, we can see that in a, in a church, people uh, refer to each other as church brothers and church sisters, and there's also a brotherhood feeling, uh, brotherhood beliefs and feelings and mindsets among soldiers in a, in a military unit. So this is the primal horde that is, is functioning, operating, is feeding and um, giving energy, giving rise to these other more advanced forms of uh, collective organization. There are, uh, Freud identifies two vast, vastly different forms of being in a primal horde, and this is, we can talk about them as, well, the first one is the father figure, who is a leader in this, uh, in a group, and the, the rest, the rest of the group. We can say the rest of the family or the followers of the, of the, um, of the father figure. And these two modes of being are so vastly different from each other that Freud says that they are, uh, there must be, two different individual psychologies corresponding to these two different modes of being. There should be a separate psychology for the, the father figure, explaining the behavior of the father figure, because that father figure usually is more morally flexible, and there are less restrictions and less, uh, fewer inhibitions to which the, the father figure is subjected. So here you can think about uh, Nietzsche's discussion in the genealogy of morals about master morality and uh, slave morality. I think there's, there are very strong parallels between uh, Nietzsche's genealogy of morals and these uh, ideas, the two sides of individual psychology in Freud, between the father figure and the followers. The father figure serves a very important function, both in family and in other places, like in religious groups and in and military organization. The father figure, the leader, uh, is an equalizer, and it is a spectacle. 
It is a spectacle because it attracts the attention from all the followers. So everybody is, becomes equal because we all pay attention to that, to the leader. And we all have the same relationship to the father figure. So in a religious organization also, everybody is equal because everybody is the same in the eyes of the, the person who is at the top of the religious hierarchy. And everybody is the same in a military organization, in, in a group of soldiers, because they all have the same role and the same relationship with that top person at the top of the organization. So the leader, the figure of the, the father, is a spectacle and an equalizer. At the same time, the followers, unsurprisingly, they have uh, mixed feelings towards this father figure and towards the group in general, because there are conflicts with which the person has to live. Conflicts between other libidinal desires, uh, what the ego, what the, what the self wants, what the self desires, and the the desires of the, the group, what the group dictates. Now, I'll say uh, there's so many, so many subtopics and themes in this book that makes this book such an enjoyable read. And it is a short book also. So I would um, definitely encourage, encourage you to, to read, read the book for yourself. There are discussions, interesting discussions about romantic love and uh, what Freud calls uh, sexual overestimation. This is the idea of when we are sexually attracted to someone, when we desire someone, then we, uh, we don't see their flaws anymore, the, the blindness of love. Um, so the last thing I want to mention is about the Freud's very interesting idea of epic poet, what the epic poet does, and why epic poets are considered, should be considered as a threat to the stability of a hierarchy. Because, according to Freud, what the epic poet produces are myths and stories that are basically, they tell, what kind of story, stories do they tell? They tell the stories of possible paths towards individuals to overtake the leader, the position of the father, to defeat the father in some way, to replace the father, or to feel the position of an absent father, something like that. So in that way, what the epic poets create can potentially uh, pose a threat because they they offer they, they they play with our imagination and they they invite us to imagine ways in which we can try to become the leader. Uh, they provide pathways in that sense, which is not surprising. Why uh, Plato, for example, I never got this when I when I was uh, reading Plato or when I was uh, reading this other discussions, pe other people discussing Plato. Why exactly did Plato uh, ban the poets? But reading Freud, I uh, it's easier to understand that objection uh, against poetry. And finally, what, uh, what is it that makes Freud uh, worthy of reading? What is it that makes Freud very, uh, very valuable? Is not necessarily the content of his writing. We might disagree with everything that he writes, but his aim, his mission, his ambition towards a general psychology or a meta-psychology is so rare. What he's trying to do, the tasks that he assigns himself, is a, is a very big task. And it is a very unifying task. We don't have many people who are even trying to do this in our time. There are a few people, including um, Niels Engelstedt and Jens Maman or Greg Henriquez. These are the general psychologists of our time. But Freud also did try to offer a constructed general psychology. It's psychology that is not fragmented into different theories, each theory trying to explain, make sense of a different phenomenon, but one psychology which then has parts for including and explaining different psychological phenomena. So reading him, reading Freud, is very useful in just seeing what it looks like for someone to try to construct a general psychology, regardless of the, the correctness or validity of all the assumptions. So this is a good book. It's a good place to start reading about Freud, group psychology and analysis of the ego. And um, if you like, let me know. I will. Uh, I, I'm interested in Freud, and I would. I would like to uh, discuss other books by him. Maybe the unconscious uh, would be the next one. So let me know if you uh, are interested in learning about Freud and what you like to hear about. Um, yeah, that's good. Thank you for your attention.